Ladies and gentlemen, let me begin on a personal note. I wish to thank Nexus and its brilliant shepherds, Rob Ryman, Evelyn Ryman, Van der Ham, for giving me the honor to speak before this wonderful forum. Nexus is one of the finest intellectual, <coughs> intellectual marketplaces in the world in the last two decades. I am excited and humbled to follow on this stage in the footsteps of my great predecessors. Let me begin on a personal note again. For many years, I have been getting up at four o'clock in the morning. A walk before dawn puts many things in proportion. For example, if on the previous evening news, a politician has used words such as forever and ever, for all eternity, or never in a million years, <coughs> at four in the morning, I can hear the stones in the desert or the stars above the city park quietly laughing at that politician's sense of time. I return home still before sunrise, make a cup of coffee, sit at my desk, and start asking myself questions. I do not ask what the world is coming to or what is the right way to go. I ask myself, what if I were he? What if I were she? What would I feel, want, fear, and hope? What would I be so ashamed of that I'd hope no one will ever know about me? My job is to put myself in other people's shoes or even under their skins. My driving force is curiosity. I was a curious child. Almost every child is curious, but few people bring their full curiosity into adulthood and old age. Now we all know that curiosity is a necessary condition, even the first condition, for every intellectual or scientific work. But I want to add that in my view, curiosity is also a moral virtue. A curious person is a slightly better person, better parent, better partner, neighbor, colleague, than a person who is not curious. I even dare say that a curious person is a better lover than a person who is not curious, but it's too early in the day to discuss in detail this aspect of curiosity. Let me suggest that curiosity, alongside humor, are two powerful antidotes to fanaticism. I have never seen a curious fanatic. I have never seen a fanatic with a sense of humor. Fanatics have no sense of humor, and seldom are they curious, because humor undermines fanaticism. Curiosity assaults fanaticism by introducing the risk of adventure questioning, and sometimes even finding that your own answers might be wrong. This leads me to the chief role of literature in particular and art in general. Their greatest merit is not suggesting social reform or making political critique. You know, the backyards of philosophy and theology are littered with skeletons of novelists and poets who wanted to compete with philosophers, theologians, ideologists, or even prophets. A very few of them succeeded, but this is beside the point. Bad literature can include very important and even positive moral messages, and it would still be bad literature. The defining feature of good literature and art, in my view, is its ability to open a third eye in our forehead, to make us see shabby old things in a wholly new way. Even an ancient vista has a moment of birth as the great Israeli poet Nathan Alterman put it. Great literature has entered the shoes and skins of others, strangers, 
sometimes obnoxious human beings, the Don Quixotes, the Yagos, the Raskolnikovs of this world. Bad literature will not open a third eye. It will simply repeat only what we already know and show us only what we have already seen many times. Bad literature, in effect, fixates the handful of moral and psychological cliches that gossip inflicts on us. Yes, I'm sorry to say, gossip is literature's poor cousin. Although literature is ashamed of this relative and will not greet it when they meet in the street. Gossip is also a child of curiosity. But gossip loves cliches. It loves reaffirming our prejudices. And it loves reassuring us that everyone is the same. Good literature does just the opposite of gossip. It tells us something we did not know about ourselves and about others, or something that he did not want to know. Because while gossip remains skin deep, good literature can sometimes accomplish the miracle of delving under the skin. And while gossip intends to flatter us, literature seeks to trouble us. Thus, a gossip will say, oh, the man is getting old. A mediocre novelist will write, old aid is such a sad affair. But Chekhov can write about an old doctor bending over a fainted girl, taking her pulse, rising up, and saying these four shuddering words. I have forgotten everything. When I write, I do not chiefly address my readers' emotions, although I speak to the emotions too. I do not chiefly address my readers' intellects, although I speak to the intellect too. First and foremost, I address their curiosity. I tell them, like a good tour guide would tell his group, to notice something fresh in a familiar scenery to imagine what it would look like if we stood not right where we are now, but if we stood on a high mountain above us, or down in the basement yard where a woman is hanging her washing. The great Israeli poet Yehuda Amichai wrote, Once I sat on the steps of the gate of David's tower. I placed my two heavy baskets on my side. A group of tourists was standing around their guide, and I became their target market. You see that man with the baskets? Just right off his head, there is, an ar there is an arch from the Roman period. Just right off his head. But he's moving, he's moving, I said to myself. Redemption will come, writes Yehuda Amichai. Redemption will come only if their guide tells them, you see that arch from the Roman period? It's not important. But next to it, left and down a bit, there sits a man who bought fruit and vegetables for his family. So please do not ask me to speak this morning as a writer about the two-state solution or the one-state solution. I have been speaking my mind on this topic for almost half a century. But I will say this, my support for two separate states, one for the Israelis, one for the Palestinians, does not stem from the historian's insight, from the politician's cunning, or from the political scientist's expertise. <coughs> I, do not, I do not have any of these. I only have curiosity and some imagination. Since my boyhood in Jerusalem, I've been asking myself what it would feel like to be a Palestinian, refugee or not. How would it be to live in a Palestinian's skin or harbor a Palestinian, Palestinian's memories, to dream a Palestinian dreams? While asking this question, I remain an Israeli Jew. 
It did not turn me into a Palestinian or make me, make me adopt every Palestinian narrative and succumb to every Palestinian demand. Nor has it led me to turn the other cheek, no. But it had inspired me to seek compromise. <laughs> 